want to welcome you all and say it is a pleasure to gather with you this morning and to open God's word with you. In just a moment, I'm going to read our preaching text for this morning. We're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 22. So grab your Bibles and open there. And if you'd like a Bible this morning, our ushers will be happy to give you one. Uh, so please turn there uh, in, in God's word. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 22. Hear the word of the Lord to us this morning. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. He was ears to hear, let him hear. Now, as we begin this morning, I have a question for you. Have you ever done something to try to prove to yourself what kind of power you actually have? Like, like for example here, you ever tried to jump off something really high or, or jump really high to see if you could defy gravity? It's kind of silly. Ever, ever dove down underwater really, really deep and stayed under a really long time to see if you could, in fact, breathe underwater? Okay, those are silly things, but I've done some silly things like that in my life. A little embarrassing story for you uh, from Sean's life here. When I was in college, uh, during my time in school, I, I, was, I was falling more and more in love with Jesus. Right? I was serving, I was studying the word, I was filling my mind with all kinds of great teachings, and I was enthralled by what I saw Jesus doing in Scripture, by who it was revealing him to be. And I remember thinking about the story of Jesus when he calms the storm. I'm sure you know it well. In the Gospels, there's this story where the disciples are out on the Sea of Galilee. These professional fishermen who probably spent their entire lives out on the water, and a great storm comes up. And the wind is blowing and howling, and the waves are crashing in the boat. And these professional fishermen think, we're going to die. We're drowning here. And so they wake Jesus up, who's asleep in the boat. What does Jesus do? He calms the storm. He says, peace, be still. You know what happens next? The Bible tells us the wind ceased and there was a great calm. The word of the Lord is powerful, isn't it? So here I am reading these stories. And I remember one day in college when a big storm blew through. The wind was howling, the rain was pouring, so I went out on the bluff at my school overlooking the Willamette River, and I yelled and shouted at that storm, peace, be still. <laughs> you know what happened next? You can tell by your laughter, you know. Nothing happened, right? Surprise, surprise, nothing happened. The wind raged and the rain came down and the storm went on. And that should be no surprise because the words of Sean are not the words of God. And yet my young heart was filled with such joy as I considered the greatness and the power of the word of the Lord. Think about the power of the word of God. Through the word, God created all things. The Bible tells us in the beginning, God spoke and things came to be. Through the word, God sustains all things. Hebrews 1 tells us he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Through the word, God gives faith. Romans 10, faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Through the word, God guides us. The psalmist says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Through the word, God gives eternal life. There's a story in John chapter six. These people, these disciples are abandoning Jesus and he turns to his disciples and says, what about you guys? And Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And it is through the word of God that we are born again. 
As we see in our passage this morning, new life comes through the word of God. Now, I want to set the scene a little bit. Give us a little context for our passage this morning. These last four weeks, we've been working our way through 1 Peter chapter 1, which is all about the living hope we're to have as believers. We, who have been born again, have been born again to a living hope. And that hope does not disappoint. This hope is sure. It is secure. It is a hope that is alive. It is a confident expectation for all the promises of God to come true because they're rooted in who God is and what God has done. We've been given this new life. We've been given a living hope. And because we have new life, Peter says, we are to live differently than the rest of the world. We saw this last week. Last week, we saw that we are to live holy as we set our hope fully on the grace of God. We have holy minds, holy lives because of our holy Savior. Last week, Peter reminded us that hope and holiness are linked together because of what Christ has done for us. And this morning, Peter just continues on to tell us what this new life in Christ is supposed to look like. What he tells us is that new life through the word New life through the word, it loves. And new life through the word endures. And new life through the word, it grows. It loves, it endures, it grows. And this is what I think the Holy Spirit wants us to see this morning as we come to this text. But before we get to how we are to live in love and enduring and in growth, I want us to see where new life comes from because Peter tells us something incredible in this passage. As important as the commands are to to how we're supposed to live, they're always grounded in the realities of what God has done. The imperatives of Scripture, they always flow out of the indicative truths that are there. If we get that backwards, we blow the gospel. We distort the grace. We do not understand rightly what God has done if we get that backwards. Our righteous living is always to be motivated by God's saving work first. And so Peter grounds these commands for living holy. The commands we'll see this morning in our text in the reality that we have been born again through the word of God. This is what he tells us in verses 22 and 23. Look there with me. Let me show you what Peter means. Verses 22 and 23 of chapter one, Peter says this, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, here's the command. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. But then the reason, since or because, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. So note that command, to love. We'll come back to that in a few minutes. But what is that command rooted in? Do you see it in our text? Why are we to love? Because of the reality of verse 23 since you have been born again. Love, but why? Because you've been born again. Or to say it another way, because we have been born again, then we are to love. And this is the pattern of biblical Christianity. The indicatives, the the truth claims about who God is and what he has done, they always precede the imperatives, those commands that scripture gives us. And therefore, our obedience to these commands is always in response to what God has done. We're always answering back to God. And this is grace for us, friends. Grace is the reality of what God has done outside of us, and even in spite of us at times. It's the reality of God's favor despite human demerits. But if we get that backwards and think that God responds to our obedience then we have absolutely destroyed grace and have lost the essence of Christianity. Grace always comes first. Then obedience follows. So since we have been born again, we are to love. But now here comes the question. If we have been born again, where does this new life come from? And Peter tells us it comes through the very word of God. Look closely at verse 23. He says, you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. You see that there? It is through the word that we are born again. New life comes through the word. 
Now, there's an interesting contrast that is set up here in 1 Peter chapter 1. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, Peter told us that we're born again, that new life comes through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Do you remember that from a few weeks ago? Verses 3 and 4 of chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father, Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. But in 123, he tells us that we're born again. We have new life through the word of God. So which is it, Peter? Is it through the resurrection of Christ? Is it through the word? Is Peter contradicting himself here? Not at all. I don't believe that for a second. First, I don't believe that the Bible has any sort of contradiction in itself whatsoever. The Bible is internally consistent and without error. But secondly, Peter here has written only 10 sentences. He just said, through the resurrection, then he says, through the word of God. It's not like he forgot about resurrection and now it's the word of God or vice versa. He's not contradicting himself. What I think Peter's doing here is giving us different aspects of the way in which we're born again. Let me explain. You see, Jesus tells us that we're born again through the spirit of God, through the Holy Spirit. We saw that a number of weeks ago. The Holy Spirit is the agent by which we are born again. It's the Holy Spirit doing that regenerating work within us to give us new hearts, new lives, new desires. It's by the Spirit that we're born again. But then 1 Peter 1, verses 3 and 4 tell us that we're born again through the resurrection. And what I think Peter is showing us here is that our being born again is rooted in a historical event. The resurrection is a summary. It's a summary way of saying the substitutionary work of Jesus. To say we are born again is to say that we're saved. We're born again through the incarnation, life, death, resurrection, exaltation of Jesus, all of which are an historical happening which happened outside of ourselves. We're born again not because of what we have done, but we're born again because of what God has done through the God-man, Jesus Christ. We're born again not through our means, but through the work of God. Do you see that there? We're born again through something that happened outside of us, totally had nothing to do with us through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, this work in history. Now, don't hold me to this, okay? Don't, this may not be 100% accurate, but we might say that we are born again, that we have new life through the Spirit. The Spirit is the agent by which we are born again. And then the resurrection proves the power of God and gives the possibility that we might be born again. You see, if God can raise Jesus from a physical death to a new and resurrected life, then how about us? How about the reality for us to have new spiritual life in God? You see, the resurrection is proof of the power and possibility of resurrection life. And then Peter tells us, though, that it is also through the word that we are born again in verse 23, which I think is really interesting here. He talks about being born again through the word. Let's understand what that word is. That's important here. Peter tells us what the word is in verse 25. Look just down a little bit. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. You see, through the word and through the preaching of the word, through the preaching of the gospel, new life comes to us. I think that's really similar to what Paul says in Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So what happens when the good news is preached? As we hear about our sin and our separation from God, we hear of our need of a savior. We hear about the work of what Jesus has done outside of us to reconcile us back to God again. Then the Holy Spirit comes and begins to do his sovereign work of bringing conviction of sin and repentance which gives birth to faith in us, which leads us to a great and living hope. Then God begins to woo and to call as the gospel is proclaimed. You see, as we hear the words of the gospel, the word comes in resurrection power. When the seed of the word is planted, it takes root in our hearts and lives and it sprouts up and it gives birth to new life. This is what the Father and the Son and the Spirit do through the gospel message. This is the power of the word of God to bring about new life in us. 
And so we're born again through the resurrection, through an historical event, but also through the preaching of the word that wells up within us, this subjective experience of faith and love and hope as we praise God for what he has done. It is the word which does this. To borrow a phrase from another pastor that I love, it, it is this. It is God at work through the world, or in the, through the word, in a world gone awry, which brings us new life. It is the word that gives us new life. And friends, this is why we strive to be a word-centered church in all that we do, in all of our ministry endeavors, from Sunday morning gatherings to how we do music, to our children's ministry downstairs, to our men's and women's events and our life groups, all that we do, we long to have the good news of the word at the center of it all. That's because there's only one word that can give us life. That's the word of God. Truly, Jesus has the words of life, as Peter affirms. It is through the word, through the hearing and the believing in the word that we receive this new life. And that is why we must study the word and know the word, and why we must love the word, and why we sing the word to one another and speak the word and preach the word and live the word. It is through and only through the word of God that new, eternal, an abundant life can come to us. And so Peter tells us that we are born again through the living and abiding word of God. What we see here, new life comes through the word. Now sticking with Peter's logic here, since we have been born again through that word of God preached to us, how then are we supposed to live? Well, Peter tells us pretty clearly, new life loves the new life that we're to have. As we live this new life, we are to love one another. Look at verses 22 and 23. And actually, it may be helpful to take these backwards to see Peter's logic here. Read this backwards here. Since you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God, therefore, love one another earnestly from a pure heart having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love. You see the logic? Since being born again, love earnestly. Or as Peter said, having purified your souls to your obedience to the truth for a sincere and brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart since you've been born again. You see, new life loves. Because we've been born again, we are to love earnestly from a pure heart with a sincere brotherly love. In fact, Peter gives us two reasons why we are to love. The first we've already seen, it's because we've been born again. That's why we are to love. But the other reason that Peter gives us is at the beginning of verse 22. Our souls have been purified for this very purpose. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere and brotherly love. That for is key there. It tells us the reason. Our souls have been purified for a sincere and brotherly love. Because our souls are purified, we love. Because we're born again, we love. New life loves. If there was a one-word summary for a God-honoring way of life, what do you think that one word would be? Love, right? I mean, this is what Jesus told us. When asked the summary of the law, Jesus sums it up like this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And he says, on these two things hang the law and the prophets. Everything is summed up in this word, love. That's because new life loves. Now, we need to be careful here because the word love is open to a wide array of interpretations in our day. Have you seen those signs around our community places that say, we believe that love is love is love? They're all over my neighborhood. Lots of places in front of their houses have these these signs that are out. And that's pretty catchy propaganda, but it's propaganda nonetheless. You see, it's, it's really effective to create a slogan that sounds plausible using really imprecise and vague language because then you can import all kinds of meaning into that slogan and you'll have people rally behind it as if it were some sort of self-evident truth. 
Friends, we must be wise as serpents when it comes to the political slogans and worldly propaganda that is all around us. What's the problem with the statement, love is love is love? The problem is, what do you mean by love, right? Love has all kinds of different meanings. And whether I can get behind your slogan or your cause really depends on what defines love and who defines what love is. The problem we have is that in the English language, we only have one word, love, that does all kinds of things. It does all of the heavy lifting. And we make no distinctions between this type of love and that type of love. But in all kinds of other languages, there are multiple different types of love and words used for that. For example, because Valentine's Day is coming up, there are seven different types of love in the Greek language. There is philautia, which is a love of self, how a person views themselves, right? There's storge, which is a familial type of love, the love for a mother towards her child. There's eros, which is that passionate, often sexual type of love. There's mania, which is an obsessive love. That's the love of a stalker for their prayer, for their prey. That's not a good type of love, by the way. <laughs> there's, there's pragma, which is a practical love based on duty and obligation. There's philia, which is an affectionate, brotherly type of love for a friend. And there's agape, which is an unconditional, sacrificial love. It's often used to describe the love of God towards us. And it's this agape type of love that Peter tells us to exercise toward one another. So when the slogan says, love is love is love, I want to ask, well, what type of love are you actually talking about there? Because if you're trying to say that eros or mania are agape, well, then I highly disagree and I can't support what you're saying. And reality is what they mean with that saying is that Love is this acceptance of any and every lifestyle choice without question or consequence. But that's not love, friends. That's foolishness. That's actually a lack of love. I love my children deeply. But that doesn't mean I just accept everything they do and say it's right and good as if it were something to be embraced. As a loving father, I reject a lot of what they do. I correct them and I discipline them in genuine, earnest love for my children so that they would grow, that they would live rightly in this world. To not do that is to not love. And so we need to know what this type of love is that we are to have toward one another. And in our text, fortunately, Peter gives us some helpful descriptions of what that love is to look like. So going back to our text, Peter speaks of a sincere brotherly love in verse 22. This is the love for others that is to be genuine. Genuine is the way we are to love. Now, this word genuine, more woodenly, could be translated unhypocritical. It's a love that is not two-faced. It does not say one thing and then do another. It does not make promises that it cannot fulfill. It does not act one way in one situation and then totally different in another way. It is not false or phony. Rather, it is true and authentic. It is sincere. This love follows through. It shows up. It does what it says it will do. It is dependable. It is genuine, as Peter says. And Paul, like Peter, encourages us towards the same type of genuine, unhypocritical love. He tells us about it in Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 12. He uses the exact same word as Peter for genuine love, Look at what he says. Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Let love be genuine or unhypocritical. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, but fervent in the spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Paul here gives us a picture of what this unhypocritical love looks like. It abhors evil. It holds fast to what is good. It loves with brotherly affection. It seeks to outdo in showing honor. It is not slothful in zeal, but fervent in the spirit. Genuine love serves the Lord. It rejoices in hope. It is patient in tribulation. It is constant in prayer. This is genuine, unhypocritical, sincere brotherly love. 
And we're to love like this because of the new life we have of the word. Friends, is your love genuine? Does it lead you to hate what is evil and to cling to what is good? Is there a brotherly affection in your love? Honor in your love? Hoping and rejoicing? Is your love for your brother and sister leading you to pray for them? Is your love genuine? Or are you a hypocrite in your love, saying you will do these things but never actually following through? You see, new life loves unhypocritically. Then Peter goes on to give us one other descriptor here. In the middle of verse 22, he says, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Love earnestly. This word earnest shows up in two other places in the New Testament, which I think give us a great description of what this looks like. One is in Acts chapter 12. If you know the story of Acts 12, it's the story of Peter sitting in prison awaiting certain death from Herod and how God miraculously delivers him out of prison. Now, Peter was one of the most important leaders in the early church. And being in prison, awaiting his death, led the church to pray. And that's what the church is doing during the time of his imprisonment. First, or, uh, Acts 12, verse 5. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer was made for him by, to God by the church. There's our word, earnest. Now, imagine for a minute here that one of the key leaders in, in Christianity today was thrown in prison and about to be killed. Pick your favorite one. Or maybe let's think back from a generation ago. Maybe it's, maybe it's Billy Graham who is in prison, about to be beheaded. At the height of his evangelistic reach, he's been captured and thrown in prison. Now imagine the prayers that Christians around the world would be offering up to God. Imagine the intensity that is there the fervor, the the earnestness, the constancy of those prayers. Now, I'm sure there would be nonstop, 24 hours a day, seven day a week, prayer gatherings all over the world, praying that Billy Graham would be released from prison. That's the earnestness of the prayer for Peter. And we are to love with that type of earnestness. Similarly, one other place this shows up is in Luke chapter 22. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Luke records, and being in agony, Jesus prayed more earnestly and his sweat became like drops of blood falling to the ground. His agony was so great, his prayer so earnest. There was such a passion and an intensity and a zeal in this prayer that he began to sweat drops of blood. This is earnest prayer. It's the same word that Peter uses to describe the earnest love we are to have for our brothers and sisters. Peter tells us, love one another earnestly. Love one another with this passion and zeal, with the intensity and constancy of Jesus' prayer in the garden or the church in the prayer meeting. Both prayed as if life depended upon it because it did. And this is how we are to love one another. So are you loving with this earnestness of love? A love so great that it makes you sweat drops of blood. A love so constant that it breaks the chains of bondage. A love so fierce that it defeats the plans of the enemy. A love that moves you to pray. A love that moves you to honor. A love that moves you to hate what is evil. A love that resembles the love of God for us. Love that sacrifices everything for another. Peter calls us to this earnest, genuine love and to love earnestly with a pure heart. He says, since we have been born again, new life loves. Living new through the word means that we are to love. Then Peter goes on to show us something else about this new life through the word that there is an enduring and hope-giving quality to the the life we have because of Jesus. And we should not pass that by. You see, Peter speaks of our being born again through the word, and he shows us that new life also endures. Look what he says in verses 23 through 25. He says, you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. 
For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. You see, we have new life through the word, but it is not of perishable seed. Rather, it is imperishable. It endures. And Peter goes on to quote from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 6 through 8, to support what he is saying. And what does Peter mean here? Well, there's a contrast between these two different types of seed. One is perishable, the other imperishable. One like grass and flower that wither and fall, this is the perishable seed. And the image is, imagery is vivid. I'm sure we all can understand how the scorching heat of the summer sun can cause the grass and the flowers to wilt and to burn. My wife and I have tried planting gardens and flowers many a time. I simply do not have a green thumb. It seems like days after we plant stuff, they have browned out and have withered and have died. Now, some of you are good gardeners, right? Some of you can actually keep your plants alive much longer than I can. But we know that eventually they will wither. They will fall away. The grass will turn brown. The flower will wilt and it will fall. Even in Washington, where our climate is so mild, eventually it all will die. Unless it's scotch broom, then that stuff lives forever. <laughs> but the grass, the flower, they do not last for they, are not, for they are perishable. In time, they will wither and fall. And so it is with our natural life. That's what Peter's saying to us. So it is for us. The seed of the flesh does not last. It is perishable. But in contrast to this seed is the imperishable seed through which we are born again. And this seed is the living and abiding word of God. And Peter quotes Isaiah because the word of the Lord remains forever, as Isaiah says. Whereas the perishable seed is fleeting, the imperishable seed is enduring. It is living and it is lasting. The word of the Lord remains forever. And so if we are born again to new life by this imperishable seed, what does that mean for us? It means that our new life will endure eternally. It will last forever. It will have no end. It is imperishable because of the imperishable ability of the word of God. And why does Peter share this with us? Because it should lead us toward massive and radical hope in our lives. If the word of God is eternally enduring, then what it produces also will be eternally enduring. It will have no end. And so there is a great assurance and a great hope that we should have because we have been born again. Through the living and abiding word, we will endure forever. And what God is working in us will endure forever. And so in this, we should have a massive, radical hope. Does that give you hope, friends? It does to me. Knowing that the work that God is doing in me will endure gives me hope. It will not perish, but it will come to fruition. Knowing that even when things get rough, the seed that is now taking root in my life leads me to hope that tomorrow will be better than today. And it leads me to have a sense of endurance, knowing that whatever may come, the new life in Jesus Christ is imperishable. And because it comes from the living and abiding word of God that has no end, we can have great hope. And so we see that new life through the word endures. So be encouraged, friends. Press on, knowing that you have been born again through imperishable seed, the word of God. And that same enduring word which gives life to us is still at work within us. And so we see new life loves and new life endures. And finally here, new life also grows. We should expect that, right? Seeds grow. Babies grow. If we've been born of imperishable seed, we should expect that to cause growth in our lives. If we're born again like newborn infants, we should likewise expect that we would grow. And so living new means that we are to grow up into salvation and to do so through the very same word of God that gives a life to us in the first place. 
This is what Peter tells us in chapter two, verses one through three. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Now there's an interesting translation decision that has to be made here concerning this pure spiritual milk. What exactly Peter means here is a little bit debated, but the majority of commentators and about half of the English translations we have, I compared like 60 of them this week, they all make the connection, or I should say about half of them make the connection between the word of God and our being born again and this pure spiritual milk that we are to long for. They call it the milk of the word. For example, the ESV here says long for pure spiritual milk, but the NASB, as you can see, says long for the pure milk of the word. Or the CSB, desire the pure milk of the word. So it seems there's a connection between this pure milk and the word of God. And the reasoning here is a little bit technical. It's based on the etymology of the word. It's a little foggy. And that's okay if you think differently here than than maybe what they're saying. But what is clear is the command to long for this pure spiritual milk, whatever it is, to long for it and to long for its effects. This is the command. Like newborn infants, long for pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. You see, it is through the word that we begin this journey of salvation, and it is through the word of God that we continue on to grow up into the salvation that God has for us. You see, just as a nursing nursing child is nourished from the pure milk of its mother, and just as a baby daily, even hourly, longs for its mother's milk, so it is to be with us. We are nourished, and we are strengthened by pure spiritual milk. And just as a child is nourished and thus grows, so it is with us. We are to grow up into salvation, nourished, by the pure spiritual milk of the word. Grow up, Peter says, into this salvation. And what does that look like to grow up? What does that mean for us to grow up? Well, I think Peter gives us a glimpse. It looks like putting away what is impure and growing into that which is pure. It leads us to put aside, to put away, to put off the things of the old way of life and to put on the things of Christ. And what are some of those things we're to put off? Well, that's what Peter tells us in chapter two, verse one. He says, you wanna grow up into salvation, into holiness, into moral purity? Here's what that will look like. Put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Put away the things which are impure and long for that which is pure, the spiritual milk by which we grow up into salvation. What is fascinating here in this list of things we're to put off? These are far less a list of actions and more like attitudes and conditions of the hearts. Malice. Malice is this mean-spirited or vicious attitude. It's this desire to do evil. Deceit might be the one thing that is in action here, but it is lying, trickery, treachery, misrepresenting what is true. Hypocrisy, saying one thing and doing another, being two-faced. Envy is jealousy, discontent with what you've been given. Slander is purposely damaging someone else's reputation. It's evil speech, it's defamation. And there is a lot of impurity in our world, probably even within us, isn't there? We just call it by different names. It's not malice, I just have a grudge. It's not deceit, I'm sharing with you alternative facts. I'm not a hypocrite, I'm just living my truth. I don't envy, I demand equity. I don't slander, I just tell it like I see it. But even though we don't label these things like the Bible does, we certainly see their fruit all around us, the fruit of bitterness and discontentment and a lack of trust, confusion, anger issues. It's all around us, and sometimes it is even in us. None of these things are of God, though. They are all of the flesh and of the devil. They are impure and unholy. And so Peter tells us, put them away, put them off, cast them aside. 
He uses the language of changing clothes, literally taking off your garments, put them away from you. The things that are stained from this world, the impurity, put it aside, put off these clothes and put on that which is pure. There to have no place for those who are living new. You see, since we have been born again through the word, there is a way in which we are to live. And it is in the way of purity, longing for pure spiritual growth, the milk that is the word of God, that we might grow up into our salvation. So rather than malice, there is to be kindness and brotherly love. Rather than deceit, there's to be truth. Rather than hypocrisy, genuineness and authenticity. Rather than envy, there's contentment. Rather than slander, we are to outdo one another in showing honor. We are to abhor what is evil and cling to what is good, to put off the old and put on the new, to put away what is impure and to long for that which is pure. We're to put away childish ways and to grow up into salvation as we are nourished by the word, which brings about a moral transformation within us. And this is what we are to long for as we live new. We do it in the power of the spirit because Jesus has caused us to be born again, to live new. And yet we do it in our strength and efforts. We partner with the spirits as we put off these things and put on that which is pure. So friend, are you growing nourished by pure spiritual milk? This we must do. And why should we long to be nourished by the pure spiritual milk of the Lord? Well, I think Peter tells us at the very, very end here. Because as Peter says in verse three, we have tasted the goodness of the Lord. Put away all malice and deceit, hypocrisy and envy and slander. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. And this if here is really like a rhetorical question. The obvious answer is for those who have been made new, who are living this new way of life, we have tasted the goodness of the Lord and of his word. It seems to me this is a play on this longing for pure spiritual milk. Just as a baby longs for the the taste of its mother's milk, so we should long for the sweetness of the Lord and his goodness. The word and the way of God are good. It is sweet, my friends. And when you taste it, you can't help but desire more of it. Speaking of the word of God, the psalmist says, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Or the quotation from Psalm 34, 8, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. And friends, I can tell you from my own experience, there is a sweetness and a goodness to the Lord. There is nothing better or more to be desired than God. Nothing more sweet or pure, nothing more lasting or enduring, nothing more full of hope and more full of love for us than the goodness of God. And there is nothing in my life that I would rather pursue than the goodness of the Lord. And that doesn't mean there aren't times when sin and temptation come and there's failings and fallings, but in those moments I see so quickly that though sin may be sweet in the moments, It is fleeting, and the aftertaste is bitter and long-lasting. But truly, there is nothing so sweet, so satisfying, so nourishing, or so good as the good news of Jesus. He is the one who loved us with an earnest love. He is the one who caused us to be born again, and he is the one sweeter than the sweetest honey we can find. Friends, I have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. And I know that to be true. And I praise God for that. And I know many of you do as well. But if you have not tasted of the goodness of Lord, of the Lord, then I want to extend that same invitation to you this morning. David says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And so come and taste the goodness of living new through the word. Come and taste the blessedness of the gospel. Come and know the love of God for you. Come and taste and grow up into the salvation that is awaiting for you. Come and receive the new life, a life of earnest love, 
a life that will endure eternally, a life full of knowing the goodness of God. Taste and see that Christ, the Lord, that he is good. Friends, there is a beauty of living new. It is the life of living in a community of love, a place where unhypocritical, earnest, and fervent love is lived and displayed. Living new is living a life of everlasting endurance, birth from seed which will not perish. Living new is a life of purity and growth, of spiritual nourishment, of drinking in the pure spiritual milk of the word. And living new is a life of the sweetness and the goodness of the Lord. You see, we have been born again to a living hope and living new is that living hope And we've been born again to living holy. Living new is that holiness. And so friends, let us continue to taste the goodness of living new. It is the life of earnest love, of enduring power and of spiritual growth and purity. And this comes through the living and abiding word of God. And so through the word, may we love earnestly, may we endure eternally, and may we grow spiritually since we have been born again. May we be a people who are living new. Let's pray. Oh, gracious Lord, we are ever thankful for your word, that through it we might receive this new life. Father, we have been born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus and to the living and abiding word which lasts forever. And so God, As the word has gone forth in our midst, I pray that it would have its effect upon us. Let it take roots in our hearts and in our lives that we might receive life. And we pray for any who are here who may not know the beauty and the wonder of the gospel, that imperishable seed would be planted and it would grow. And we pray that we would not walk in impurity, but would long for pure spiritual milk and that all might receive this salvation. And so we pray that we would taste and see of your goodness and be drawn into your kingdom. And Father, we also pray for all of us who've been born again that likewise the word would plant deeper roots and cause greater growth in us. Give us all a desire for more of the word and a desire to live according to it and cause us to be a people who love earnestly and who grow into the image of Christ. Cause us to live new as you have called us. We ask it. In Jesus' name, amen.